on something on Wednesday night. And uh, it was like, I, could, I just felt like God wanted me to preach this sermon and, and really to emphasize this right now and to come back and do a whole sermon on this subject because there's so much in the Bible about this subject and there's so much that I want to teach on this subject and I feel like it's a very misunderstood subject. And if it's something that the Bible emphasizes, I just feel like it's something that we need to emphasize. And I think that this would really transform your life if you get a hold of this truth. But if you remember uh, in my sermon on John chapter 7, I read this scripture. And you don't have to turn to John 7, but if you would, please turn to John chapter 20. Turn to John 20, and I'm going to read for you from John 7. And uh, the first couple of minutes will be review, and then I'm going to get into completely new material. But I, I think this subject is so important, and when I preached on it on Wednesday night, I just felt bad that I just barely mentioned it for five minutes of the sermon when it's so important. And so look, if you would, at John 20. I'm going to read for you John 7, 39. The Bible says, But this spake he of the Holy... I'm sorry, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And so we talked about on Wednesday night how the moment that you believe on Jesus Christ, because of course Jesus has died and been buried and he's risen from the dead, he has been glorified, and so the moment that you believe on Jesus Christ, you received the Holy Spirit indwelling you permanently. The Bible said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So either you have the Holy Spirit living inside you or you're not saved. And the moment that you believe on Jesus Christ, you receive the, the earnest of your salvation, which is the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But in John chapter 7, that was not the case. Because the Bible said that the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, look at John 20 and we'll see when they received the Holy Ghost. Now notice the, this word, receive, very important. In John 7, he said, the Holy Spirit was not give, given that they should receive. Okay, those that believe on him should receive. Let's see when they received the Holy Spirit. Look at John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now you see that? Receive the Holy Ghost. They were indwelled by the Holy Ghost at that moment. Now turn to Acts chapter 1. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read you another scripture. This is Luke 24. This is the same time period. This is where Jesus is with the disciples after he's risen from the dead. In Luke 24, 49, he says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And then in Acts 1, verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now let's look at one more scripture, verse 8. It says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. So we see that there are two very different things being discussed here. One is the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and one is the Holy Ghost upon you, which translates into power, is what the Bible says. He says, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And he said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come out. Did they already have the Holy Spirit living inside them? Yes. They were dwelled by the Holy Spirit back in John chapter 20, but he said, wait, before you go out preaching the gospel, before you go out and, and preach at the day of Pentecost and uh, 120 people go out soul winning, before that, you need to get endued with power from on high, he said in Luke 24, 49. He said, you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Is that salvation? No, they were already saved, they were already dwelled by the Holy Spirit, but they needed the Holy Spirit upon them. Now, in John 7, 39, God clearly said that the Holy Ghost was 
not yet given as far as receiving the Holy Spirit inside of you. That did not happen. But were people in the Old Testament filled with the Holy Spirit? Were people in the Old Testament anointed with the Holy Spirit? Did the Holy Ghost come upon people in the Old Testament with great mighty power? Yes. And so, in the Old Testament, we read of men like Moses having the Holy Ghost upon him. We read about uh, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon the 70 elders of Israel at the time of Moses. We read about Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother, having the Holy Spirit come upon him in great power in the book of Judges chapter 3. We read about the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Amasai. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Elijah. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Elisha. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Micaiah. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. Hey, do you see that this is being emphasized in the Bible, in the Old Testament? The Holy Spirit coming upon people? You say, well, that was the Old Testament. That, that's over with. No, it isn't. Wrong. The same Holy Spirit that came upon Saul, the same Holy Spirit that came upon David, is the same Holy Spirit that will come upon men and women today. And I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. Now, God did not replace the Holy Spirit upon you with the Holy Spirit. He added the Holy Spirit coming inside of you. You see, Jesus said in, in John 14, He said that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, He said He's with you, but he shall be in you. He's already with you, but he shall be in you. That's the difference. God added the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is permanent, but the, the, the Old Testament Spirit of the Lord coming upon you has never changed and never will change. You see, I've heard people say this. Well, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was temporary. In the New Testament, he's permanent. Wrong. The Spirit of the Lord upon you is still temporary. What he added was a permanent indwelling. Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of him. His. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer. But has every believer been endued for, with power from on high? Has every believer been anointed with the Holy Ghost power? Does every believer have the Holy Spirit upon them right now? Is every believer filled with the Spirit right now? If so, then why would Paul command, be filled with the Spirit? If it was automatic, where does God command you? Be indwelled by the Spirit. It doesn't make any sense. You're already indwelled by the Spirit. But he commands you to be filled with the Spirit. Now, I'm going to show you this doctrinally because people have so many wrong ideas about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. People have so many wrong ideas about what it means to have the Holy Ghost upon you. And really, the charismatic movement has turned it into some kind of a circus. The Holy Spirit upon you means you start laughing hysterically or bark like a dog or talk in gibberish or slobber or fall on the ground or you slap them on the forehead and they fall over. That's, that's a lie. It's a circus. It's ridiculous. But does that change the fact that there's a reality of having the Holy Spirit come upon you in mighty power? It's still a reality. It's still something that needs to be part of your life. Look at Acts chapter 2. I'm going to show you right now this is not something that's just for the pastor, Pastor Stephen Anderson. This is not something that's just for men. This is for men, women, boys, and girls need to be filled with the Spirit. Let me show it to you. And I'm going to show it to you doctrinally tonight. I mean, we're going to leave no stone unturned tonight. I mean, we're going to see what the Bible teaches on this subject. Old Testament, New Testament. Hey, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. We're going to see it all throughout the Bible tonight. And not only that, but I'm going to make the application tonight. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave no stone unturned, uh, God willing, and I'll show you everything that I can. But look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Let's see the fulfillment of that promise that they would be endued with power from on high. Let's see what it means to have the Spirit of the Lord come upon you, as we saw in the Old Testament. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Remember that phrase. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to sputter. 
And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Then he begins to list the languages. This isn't babbling and, you know, the so-called tongue speaking of our day. This is men preaching the gospel in a foreign language to men who speak a foreign language. They miraculously got the ability to speak in a language that they'd never learned in order to get the gospel to somebody who needed to get saved who did not speak uh, Aramaic, which is the language they were speaking at the time. And so here it lists the language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. Hey, listen, Pentecostal, Phrygia, hey, Church of Christ, Pamphylia in Egypt, hey, charismatic, babbling, tongue talker. It's every nation under heaven listed here by name. This was not jabbering. This was not nonsense. It was the word of God being preached in a foreign language. God's word being articulated clearly in a way where people said, I understand this. I understand the truth. I believe on Jesus Christ because I've heard the word of God in my language wherein I was born. That's what real speaking with other tongues was in the Bible. But look, if you would, at verse number 11. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our, in our tongues the wonderful works of God. But now look down at verse 16. It says in verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Does that sound familiar? The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. It says, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You say, Peter preached and 3,000 people got saved. No, he didn't. Peter doesn't preach until later, and the people who got saved when Peter preached did not number 3,000. Peter preached only to the Jews who were Hebrews who lived at Jerusalem and spoke his language. He got up and spoke in their language. They heard, but there were 119 other people, according to Acts chapter 1, that were also preaching the gospel. And you know what? Some of them were women. Because God says that this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel when he said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So we see that there were men and women preaching out. Now, we're not talking about a woman preaching in church. God help us. The Bible says that a woman is to keep silent in the church, for it is not permitted unto her to speak. Oh, Pastor Anderson, may I have permission to speak? No. <laughs> hey, you no, know, you don't have permission Men, when we're assembled here, and by the way, the church is not the building. Oh, so if I come in the building, I can't talk? No, but the church is not the building, okay? The church is the group here. When we're assembled together, and the Bible says that the woman is to learn in silence. That's, uh, I believe, 1 Timothy chapter 2, where he uses those words, to learn in silence. Perhaps Titus. But uh, learn in silence. So when it's time for the preaching, I mean, we all sing the songs together congregationally, man, woman, boy, girl. But when it's time for preaching, when it's learning time, it's silence time for women. Will there ever be a woman stand behind this pulpit and preach? No, never, never, never will any woman stand behind this pulpit and preach or teach the Word of God for any reason to anyone. But, do I believe in women preachers? Yes, I do. Out, house to house, hey, we had a bunch of women out preaching today, door-to-door -door soul winning. Preaching the gospel. And that's what we had here. Out in the streets of Jerusalem. Women preaching the word of God. It said that the Holy Spirit was upon them while they were doing it. And that's why many women here had people saved. As well as men having people saved. He says here, it shall come to pass in the last days. Saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens. Another reference to females here. Uh, and on my servants and on my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. You see, listen ladies. You, you want to go out soul winning? You want to see people saved? Uh, and by the way. You know why God said, wait for the promise of the Father which saith he. You've heard of me. You know why he said, don't leave Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high? Because God didn't ordain a door-to-door -door door -door salesman as a soul winner. You see, you're not going out as the Avon lady. Listen, sir, this isn't a Kirby vacuum that you're selling. 
This is a spiritual matter. This is going to take a spiritual person with a spiritual book, the Bible, bearing precious seed, the holy word of God. Hey, you're going to have to be a spirit-filled soul winner when you want to see these kind of results of people getting saved like they saw in the book of Acts. You say, wow, how did all those people got saved? I'll tell you how they got saved. Because they were all with one accord in one place. The whole church. I'll tell you why all those people got saved. Because there were 120 people doing the soul winning. Well, how did all those people get saved? I'll tell you how they got saved. Because they had the Holy Ghost upon them as they preached the gospel. And ladies, men, whatever the case may be, when you go out soul winning, you better have the Holy Spirit upon you when you go out soul winning if you want to see people saved. Now, you can go out and invite people to church. But don't show up at our soul winning time because we don't do that. Uh, we're not salesmen. We're not the Avon lady. And, you know, it doesn't take the Holy Spirit to be the Avon lady. You don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to sell alarms for ADT door to door. You don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to sell a vacuum. But I'm going to tell you something. If you want to see people saved, you better have the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. And that's what Jesus said. I'm not the one saying that. That's what Jesus said. You say, well, wait a minute. I think I'm just going to wait until I know I'm filled with the Holy Spirit to go out soul winning. No, you need to get out soul winning just to even get God's attention. So that why would he anoint you with the Holy Spirit if you're not even willing to go? You need to be willing to preach the gospel first before uh, and then get right with God by going soul winning. And then and we'll, get, we'll get to that in a minute. I want, I want to explain to you later on about what it means to be filled with the Spirit and and how to be filled with the Spirit. But right now, I'm just trying to show you doctrinally that this is something for everybody. And it's something, Old Testament, New Testament. It's something for man, woman, boy, and girl. But look at Psalm 51. And, and uh, Psalm 51, and I'm going to show you my first point tonight on this subject. That was kind of a little bit of review. But in Psalm 51, we're going to see that you can lose the Holy Spirit's power upon you. You can, now, can you lose the indwelling of the Spirit? Absolutely not. But can you lose God's presence and, and power upon you? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And this is what I'm talking about. You refuse to go soul winning. I'm just not sure that I'm totally right with God, so I'm not going to go. You just, you're even, now you're even less right with God. So the answer is not to say, well, I'm not going to go soul winning until I know that the Holy Spirit's upon me. No, you know what? You better just go out soul winning and you better just do everything you're supposed to do. And and I wouldn't sit there and sit on my hands and compound the problem and make it worse. So the, the moral of the story, when Jesus is saying, you need to be endued with power from on high, he's not saying, well, don't go soul winning unless you're endued with power. He's just saying, get endued with power. Get the Holy Spirit's power. Get out of your face. And they prayed for ten days in the upper room uh, with the women, it says, all the disciples and, and the brethren of the Lord. And hey, they got on their faces and they prayed for power from God. And then they went out and had those people saved. So they don't. Uh, what I'm trying to say, and I guess I'm not making myself very understood right now or articulating very well what I mean. What I'm saying is, don't use this as an excuse not to go soul winning. Well, I'm just not ready for that. That's not what I'm trying to say at all, and I don't want you to take it that way. But look at Psalm 51, look at verse number 10. This is David after he's con committed this grievous sin with Bathsheba. I mean, he's committed adultery, and then he committed murder to cover it up. Horrible, wicked sin. Look at David's heart, though. Of course, the first nine verses, he's pouring out his heart to God, saying how sorry he is, and he's weeping before God. But in verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and watch this, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then look at the next verse. In verse number 12, he says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You see the order there? He said, I better make sure my heart's right, because I want people to get saved. You see, anybody can go out and preach the gospel. But if you really want to see a lot of people saved, if you really want to see God work, you better be filled with the Holy Spirit. And David said, I know what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, I know what it is to have God's power resting upon me. Hey, I've been there. And God, I'm so sorry that I've committed this foolish sin, this wicked sin. Why did I do it? But he said, God, please, would you not take your Holy Spirit from me? Would you please restore it from me? Because he says, I want sinners to be converted unto you. I want people to be saved. Now, David was not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. 
This is the Old Testament. This is before Jesus was glorified, John 7, 39. But he did have the Holy Spirit's power upon him. He said, I don't want to lose that. And so he said, I'm, he, he's begging God not to lose that in Psalm 51. But look at, look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 3. And you know, you got to ask yourself this. Actually, I'm sorry, look at 1 Samuel 16 first. 1 Samuel 16. You have to ask yourself this question. You want to go home tonight or, or some other night, flip on some filthy DVD, and just about every DVD, I mean, if you got it from the video store, it's filthy. Any DVD that you got from the world is trash. Because all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's all they put out. According to 1 John 2.16, that's all they put out. And if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let me ask you something. Is it really worth it to go home and turn on your stinking, filthy DVD, your PG-13, your R-rated, even the PG-rated is full of smut and filth these days. It's full of trash and garbage and sin. Hey, is it really worth God taking the Holy Spirit from off of you and saying, I'm sorry, but I can't anoint you when you're living in this kind of sin. You say, well, I just don't believe that, that God would, would, would take that away from me. You say, I've been seeing people say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus said in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. And you say, I've got the Holy Spirit upon me. I'm a soul winner. I see people say, God's not going to take that away from me. Oh, really? Look down at 1 Samuel 16 and we'll see. Here's a man, Saul. There are two men in the Bible of whom it is said about more than anyone else in the Bible, Saul and Samson. More than anyone else in the Bible, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. Those are the two people that it says about it the most. Saul is right up there with Samson for being spirit-filled, okay? Let's read about Saul. It says in 1 Samuel 16, 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, but, but the Spirit of the Lord departed Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Why is it that the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and did not depart from David? I'll tell you why. Because when David committed sin, he was in danger of the Holy Spirit departing from him. But he got on his face and he begged and cried and pleaded with God and said, God, I'm sorry. I'm, he said, I'm going to change. I'm going to repent of this. I'm not going to do this again. I'm sorry, and please would you not take your Holy Spirit from me. But you know what? Saul was unrepentant about his sin. Saul committed two grievous sins, and when he was given the opportunity by Samuel to make it right, when he was given the opportunity to say he was sorry, when he was given the opportunity to admit his fault, to confess his sin, to get it right with God, he refused to get it right. He was stubborn. He hardened his heart. And so God said, that's it. I'm going to take the Holy Spirit's power from you, and I'm going to give it to a man that is better than thou, to David. If God would do it to Saul, he'd do it to you. I'm going to tell you something. I have known preachers. I've sat and listened to preachers, and I'm telling you, the Spirit of the Lord was upon them. And they preach with mighty power. And I watched them allow sin to come into their life. And I watched their sermon become a powerless, sorry, weak, watered down. It just And sometimes the outline could have been the same. I've heard the same outline. I've heard the same illustration. There was something missing. It was the power that was missing. Same man, same outline, same illustration. The power was gone. Why? Unrepented sin in their life. I mentioned on, on, on Wednesday night, a man who, I mean a pastor that I know, I watched power go away. I watched the Spirit of the Lord depart from this preacher. Somebody told me years later, I didn't even know this, I had no idea, and I, and I, I believe I told you this on Wednesday night, I'm telling you again just in case I didn't, but a friend of mine, I talked to him years later and he said, did you know so-and-so the preacher, and it was somebody that we both knew. He said, did you know that he never used to have a TV? And I, and I, I thought he just always had TV. But he said, did you know that so-and-so did not used to have a TV? He said, he said, right about this and that time, he kind of named the time, is when he got a TV. And it was because his kids became teenagers. And so he got a television for whatever reason. The 
because they wanted to watch the television. I don't know why. And I, and I looked at the time that he said he got that television, and I thought, you know, that's about the time I started watching the power go away. I started to watch God take his hand off that preacher. Why? Because of unrepented sin. Because of just continuing in sin. Because of just living in sin. You see, God will take it away from Saul. He would have taken it away from David. And he'll take it away from you. Now, you, you know what? Some of the people in this room tonight may not even care what I'm talking about. You may be thinking, you know, so what? Well, you know what? I'm not preaching to you tonight. Go ahead and listen in to the sermon. But I'm preaching to the person who has a burning desire to be filled with the Spirit of God. I'm talking to the person who has love in their heart for lost souls who has a burning desire to go out and to see people saved. I'm talking about somebody who has a burning desire to, to preach a sermon, perhaps, and to see God's power work in people's lives and to watch people's lives change. I'm trying to preach tonight to people who want to go out and get people saved with God's power and not just invite somebody to church. Now, if that's not you, you're probably not going to get a lot out of the sermon. But if that is you, then you ought to listen carefully to what the Bible says about this important subject so that you can be like every other great man in the Bible. I mean, you go down the list, hey, they have the Spirit of the Lord upon them. All of them. Because the Spirit of the Lord is necessary to be a great soul winner. The Spirit of the Lord is necessary to be a great leader, to be a great parent, to be a great preacher. Whatever the case may be, you need the Holy Spirit upon you. Look at Ezekiel chapter number, uh, chapter number 3. Ezekiel chapter number 3. I'm going to show you something. Now, now, we'll see a pattern. There are many patterns as we study this in the Bible. But one pattern about this subject is that being filled with the Holy Spirit or having the Holy Ghost upon you, which are one and the same, and I'll prove that to you a little bit later, having the Holy Spirit upon you, being anointed by the Holy Spirit, having God's power resting upon you, is always related in the Bible to winning souls. Always. I mean, you'll see that that's the purpose. As I, as I quoted before, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. Uh, that's what Jesus said. There's a fulfillment of Isaiah 60, 61, verse 1. Uh, here in Acts 1 he says, You'll receive power to be witnesses unto me. And on and on. That's the pattern. Look at Ezekiel 3. We'll see a little bit of similarities with Acts chapter 2 in Ezekiel 3. Look at verse 12. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what was heard when, with the disciples in Acts uh, 2. Behind me he heard a, a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from, this place, from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and the noise of a great rushing. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness. Okay, so here he has a little bit of a bad attitude. He's a little bit bitter, he's a little bit angry at the situation. And I'm, I can't really go into the whole context tonight of, of the whole book of Ezekiel and explain to you the story, but he's in the bitterness of his, in the heat of his spirit. Do you see that? Are you looking down at your Bible? It says, I went in bitterness and in the heat of my spirit. But, he's saying, nevertheless, he says, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Here's a man who has the Holy Spirit upon him. Great sound of a rushing, and he has God's Spirit upon him. And it says, I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv, which is the modern-day city of Tel Aviv, Israel, that dwelt by the river of Kibar, and I sat where they sat, and remained there astonished among them seven days. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou, shalt, thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. He's telling us to go out and uh, preach the gospel, warn the wicked, Warn them of the danger that at any moment they could die and go to hell. That's why we ask the question, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? Warning people all day, I want to get some people saved. And that's where the Spirit of the Lord upon you comes in. But, he says here, 
that even though maybe his attitude wasn't right, even though he had a little bit of bitterness and anger, and he really had a lot of reasons to be angry here. He had a lot of reasons to be bitter. Who was he bitter at? Well, he's bitter at the wicked children of Israel that had sinned against God to the point where they all got taken captive to Babylon, including Ezekiel. And so here he is, he's in Babylon, he's bitter, he's mad, he's angry, but he was still filled with the Holy Ghost. He still had God's power resting upon him. He went down and sat where they sat, by the river Kibar. He pretty much experienced what they experienced. He sat down with these poor and afflicted people. Something moved in his heart. God commanded him and said, I want you to be a watchman. I want you to warn these people. I want you to preach the truth to them. And filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God in his mouth, we have the Word of God in our hand, and it should be in our mouth. He preached the gospel. He preached the truth. He preached salvation. Ezekiel did. You say, well, I don't think that's what Ezekiel preached. Well, in Acts chapter 10, it says, to him give all the prophets witness. And it talks about through uh, believing in his name, Whosoever believeth might receive remission of sins. And so, yes, Ezekiel does preach about Jesus and the gospel. And so, here we see a man who was spirit-filled and preached the truth as a soul winner. Look back at Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter number 11. Numbers chapter number 11. Look at Numbers 11, verse 24. Numbers 11.24, I'm trying to hurry tonight. Numbers 11.24, And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud, and spake unto him, that's Moses, and took of the spirit that was upon him, so Moses already had the spirit upon him, and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Why did they prophesy? Why did they not cease? You see, there are some people who start to go soul winning and then they quit. They might start preaching, they quit. They start to win souls, they start to preach the gospel, but they cease because the Spirit of the Lord is not upon them. That's what's going to keep you going. That's what's going to give you the power to endure and keep going. Uh, the Bible says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, these men continued to preach, continued to lead, continued to be what they needed to be because they had the Spirit's power resting upon them. The Bible says in uh, verse 26, But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out into the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord, Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Watch this. Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. This is for everybody. This is for you. This is something that you need to be filled with the spirit. Have the Holy Spirit resting upon you, no matter who you are, if you're one of God's people. Now, these 70 elders in the Old Testament, number 11, are a foreshadowing of the 70 apostles. Look at Luke chapter 10. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 10. You say, wait a minute, there are only 12 apostles. Wrong. That is not true. That's a common misconception. You say, well, there's a guy down the street, he says he's an apostle. Well, that's wrong too, because the Bible says that Paul was the last apostle. He said he was like one born out of due, new due time. He said, last of all me. He said, for I am the least of the apostles. And not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. According to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul was the last apostle. What was an apostle? The word apostle means messenger. The apostles were men that were specially ordained by God. And they were given specific power. And God sent them out with a very special message. And they all had something in common. And this is also in 1 Corinthians 15. They all saw Jesus after he rose from the dead and were sent out by him. Now, Jesus did have the 12 apostles. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all them. But then later, he not only sent out 12 and gave them power, but he also sent out another 70 and gave them power. Now, the way that you know that there are more than 12 apostles, number one, Paul was an apostle. 
But some people say, well, Paul just replaced Judas Iscariot. But that's not true because Barnabas was an apostle. And the Bible names a few other apostles in the book of Acts. I, I'm sorry, it does not name them, but it talks about other apostles besides the twelve in the book of Acts in addition to Barnabas being an apostle. You see, there were more than twelve apostles. There were seventy apostles. And look down here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Look at Luke 10, verse 1. After these, otherwise, how do you explain Barnabas? How do you explain these other men in the book of Acts? After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face unto every city and place whither he himself would come. So how many do you have? Other 70. So we got 12, then we have other 70, and then we have the Apostle Paul. What's that add up to? Come on. <laughs> That's, hey, 83 apostles, right? And then there's Matthias, 84, you know? And Jesus was really seen by 500 brethren at one time. So maybe, could they have been considered apostles? Personally, I don't think so. Personally, I think it's only these ones that he gave special power and ordained and sent out. So I believe that it's just the 12, the 70, and uh, Paul. How, what's that guy's name that uh, wrote like half the books in the New Testament? Um, what's that guy's name again? Paul. Yeah, no. hey, I know who Paul is. I'm sorry. But anyway, in Luke, 1, 2, Luke chapter 10, verse 2, it says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his heart. What's he send them out two by two for? Soul winning. What did he do first? He appointed them and he gives them power. Look at verse 17. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, is there such thing as a modern day apostle? No. Do we have the same power that the apostles had? No. Did you know that the apostles did special miracles? Like, for example, even if Peter just passed by someone, the, the shadow of Peter falling upon them in Acts chapter 5 says that they would be healed. Remember, uh, Paul was able to lay hands on people and just heal them of their sicknesses. Peter was able to do that. Look, I'm not able to do that. You're not able to do that. I can't just walk up to somebody and lay hands on them and they're just healed. I'd be down at the hospital healing people, you know, and be mm -hmm. healing them one after the other. But I'm not an apostle. I don't have these special miracles, but I'm going to tell you something. I have been endued with power from God on high. The Holy Spirit is upon me. Why? To do a miracle? No, to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel to every preacher. To warn the wicked of his wicked way. That's what the Bible's teaching here. Look at verse number one. Just while we're in the book of Luke, I just want to show you this. Because I'm getting into my next point. About being filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at Luke chapter one, verse 15. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. I've seen all throughout the Old Testament many, many examples of the Holy Ghost resting upon people. I've seen many, many examples of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon someone and them preaching with great power. The Spirit of the Lord coming upon people and they're prophesying. I see in, uh, all throughout the Old Testament I see that. But, what about the filling of the Holy Spirit? Is that the same thing? Is the same thing to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit upon you? Or is the filling of the Holy Spirit more like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? What does all that mean? Well, stop for a second. Look at verse, Luke, verse 15 of Luke 1. I think this will help answer your question. It's talking about John the Baptist. This is before Jesus is even born. Let alone glorified. Let alone died, buried, and rose again and glorified. It says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. By the way, that's a good place to start if you want to be great in the sight of the Lord and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It says, He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. So, had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit started yet in Luke 1.15? No, that doesn't start till after the resurrection, according to John 7.39. And so we see here that when John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit, this is the same as the anointing of the Holy Spirit back in the Old Testament. And further proof is that in Acts chapter 2, when they baptized with the Holy Spirit and it appeared to them and the rushing wind and the cloven and fire, hey, that said they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And that was the power. That was the anointing. And so we see that the filling of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of the Lord came upon fill in the blank. Those are one and the same. 
follow that? And that's proven right here again by Luke 115. But look at Ephesians chapter 5. Now, we see how important it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it's so important. He said, just get on your face and pray until you're due with power from on high. Then go out and, and see people saved. You see, there's this new thing. And while you're turning to Ephesians chapter 5, I get so sick of hearing this. I'm just going to get something off my chest right now. Okay? I get so sick and tired of hearing this because I've heard this so many times. As soon as you preach anything negative, as soon as you say anything negative, as soon as you do anything, you know, I've written articles before, you know, and put them on the internet or, or whatever. I'll write an article explaining why sentence of the Bible version is wrong. I'll write an article explaining why uh, something is, you know, wicked and sinful. We need to avoid it. We need to stay away from it. Or I'll preach on that. And invariably, I hear the same thing over and over. And I'm just so tired. But I just have to get this off my chest right now. And you're just the person who's going to hear it. But, you know, but hey, this is why I get so sick of hearing. Shouldn't we all just be out soul winning and quit worrying about all this stuff? Maybe you don't hear it that much. You're not a preacher. I'm telling you what, I get so sick of hearing that, I could just spit right now. Because I get so tired of people saying, Why, instead of worrying about all this stuff, about Bible version, King James version, we should just be out soul winning. We shouldn't be worrying about all this stuff. We should just be out winning the world to Christ. Well, first of all, I'm sorry, I'm not a charismatic. So I don't believe that the world's ever going to be won to Christ. Because I'm not a post millennial fool. I don't believe that we're going to win the whole world to Christ. Narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We're never going to win the world to Christ. Now, don't get me wrong, I want to get as many people saved as I can. But people say, oh, we should just be busy out soul winning and not worry about anything else. Let's not worry about all this Bible verse. Quit arguing and fighting with each other. You know, you know it's, and it's always, it, and half the time it's a woman saying it. You know, and that's why women shouldn't be in authority. And I'm not against women tonight, but I'm going to tell you something. A man likes to fight. Oh, isn't that horrible? That's why men are pastors, because they like to fight. Uh, am I losing you here tonight? The Bible says, fight the good fight! Listen, Tim. You know, Paul's saying, listen, Tim, fight the good fight of faith. So that's in 1 Timothy. Then in 2 Timothy, by the way, Tim, I forgot, I, may I, I just need to say it again. Fight the good fight. He says it in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Why? Because a preacher needs to know how to fight. That's why. A preacher who doesn't want to fight is a liberal and a sinner. And he's out living in sin. And he's a wimp and a phony. And he doesn't like to have anybody point him out for all the wickedness in his life. And so he just says, I just, can't, I just don't like fighting. He's like Michael Jackson. You know, he's a lover, not a fighter. That's what Michael Jackson said. Listen, Pastor Michael. Listen, listen, Pastor Michael Jackson. If you don't like to fight, then get out of the ministry. Because there's a fight going on. It's called the fight between good and evil. It's called the fight between those who love Jesus and love soul winning and love getting people saved and those who don't. There's a fight between those who love the King James Bible and they hate every false way. He says, thy word is exceeding pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. He said, I hate every false way. I hate every false Bible. I hate every phony version. Why? Because I love the Bible. And so, ladies, I'm not saying that you should be some kind of a brawling Betty or something. But you know what? A lady is not the pastor right now. A man is. And this is part of why a man is the pastor, because men love to fight. If they don't love to fight, then something's wrong with them. Look, I'm sorry, but this is the truth right now. And so men love to fight for what's right. Why do all these young men go and, and sign up to go fight in the war in Iraq? Because they like to fight. That's why. Now, I know, I'm, I'm sorry, did Barney and Friends brainwash you that fighting is wrong? I'm not saying, look, the Bible says the pastor is not supposed to be a striker. Ever since I've pastored, I have not punched anybody. I have not struck anybody. Okay? But I've done some fighting, and I'll continue to fight. And so, but, but this little, it's almost like a parrot to me now. Just, right? Shouldn't we be out soul winning? Right? With the world to Christ? Right? 
Alright, this is what people say. I don't know how you have time to do all this. You must not be soul winning. You know, I'll match my time out soul winning with any pastor that I know. And you know what? It's, it's just so dumb. I get so tired of hearing it. We should be out soul winning. I can't believe you weren't out soul winning. And you were just reading the Bible. <laughs> it's like, what, kind, what kind of sense does that make? Oh, I can't believe you were, you were writing an essay about why the King James Bible is the Word of God. You should just be out soul winning instead of messing with that. Oh, so you must go soul winning 24 hours a day except when you eat and sleep. <laughs> no, while you were watching football, I was writing that essay. While you were playing a DVD, is this what you forgot? While you were playing a DVD, I was out picking a fight with somebody. See, that's my fun. That's my recreation. Okay, that's what you're missing. Okay? Now, now, now think about this for a moment. Is that what Jesus said to the side? And listen, you're looking at somebody who loves soul winning. Hey, I was out soul winning today. I had a couple people saved this afternoon. I was out knocking the doors. I was out knocking the doors on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday of this week. And then I went out soul winning again today on Sunday. Hey, I try to go out soul winning as much as I can. I love soul winning. But I'm going to tell you something. Did Jesus say to the disciples, just go soul winning? Because that's all that matters. Just go soul winning. No, he didn't. He said, why don't you go up in the upper room for seven days? For 10 days and get on your face and pray to God till you're endued with power from on high. It's not just all about soul winning, my friend. That's what, that's what the liberals are about. All that matters is just soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. Wrong. Holiness matters. Righteousness matters. Cleanness matters. Because you can go out and go soul winning till you're blue in the face when the Holy Spirit's not upon you because you're an adulterer or you're a murderer or you're a pornographer. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. You will not see the people say that the separated soul winner has saved. And so I'm going to spend time purifying myself, cleansing my hands, purifying my heart. Why? Because I want God to use me when I go out soul winning. And I, I'm going to spend time preaching to you on sin and righteousness and judgment. Why? Because I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't want you to go out of here a powerless soul winner. Because I'm going to tell you something. You can go out soul winning for eight hours and not see anybody saved. I've done it. You can go out soul winning for hour upon hour upon hour upon hour and not have anybody saved. I'm going to tell you something. You go in the upper room and get on your face and pray and beg God. You get the sin out of your life and cleanse your hands and say, God, I'm willing to get the sin out of my life, God. I'm willing to read the Bible and meditate on God's word day and night. I'm going to pray and beg God and, and weep before God. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheep with them. I'm going to tell you something. You can get more done for God in one hour if you're filled with the Holy Spirit than in 24 hours in the flesh. And so don't ever fall into this, shouldn't we all be out soul winning? The same shouldn't you all be out soul winning people go soul winning one hour a week. They go out for 59 minutes and 59 seconds and check it off. Oh, I went soul winning. They're not out putting in the hours. Hey, we're putting in the hours here, my friend, at Faithful Word Baptist Church. But I'm going to tell you something. We better not be doing it in the flesh. Or else we could be wasting our time. Gee, didn't Jesus say, without me you can do nothing? That's what Jesus said. And so if you're going to sit there and tell me, well, don't worry so much about what version. Just win the world to Christ. You know, you got the living Bible in your hand. <laughs> I don't even think you have Jesus with you. <laughs> You got Kenneth Copeland with you. Or not Kenneth Copeland. Ken Taylor is the one. Kenneth Copeland is just as bad. But Ken, Ken Taylor is the one who wrote the Living Bible. That's who you got with you because he's the author. When I bring this Bible with me, I got Jesus with me because Jesus is the author. And so I'm going to tell you something. Don't fall into this trap of thinking that getting people saved is all that matters. Soul winning is all that matters because if you do, you can, you can uh, not take heed to keeping your heart pure. Let all the sin into your life. Let all the false doctrine into our church. Oh, I can't believe you want to fight. You know what? You know what? People who don't fight, you know what happens to them? They get defeated. The Bible.